Hello and welcome to this session of the Spears Wealth Insight Forum. My name is Edwin Smith. I'm the editor of Spears, the wealth, business, culture and lifestyle magazine for high net worth individuals and the people who advise them. The title of this panel discussion is Generation Game, the shifting priorities of HNW families. And it's brought to you today in association with IQEQ. Now, to get to the heart of the matter, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by an absolutely first-class panel. We have Steve Sokic, Head of Private Wealth at IQEQ, Justine Markovitz, Chairperson and Partner at the international law firm Withers, Mark Campanale, Founder of the Carbon Tracker Initiative and a pioneer of sustainable finance, and Rennie Hall, Head of Philanthropy and Partner of Private Bank, C. Hall & Co. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Now, several forces are changing the behaviours of h &W families, their offices, the investments they make, the structures they deploy. One of the most significant is the emergence of a new generation, which has different priorities. What we'll address in our discussion today is who those people are, what motivates them, and what that means for their trusted advisors and the families themselves. So, without further ado, Steve Sokic, perhaps you could start us off by giving us just a high level view of what's widely referred to as the next gen, this cohort within HNW families that are coming to the fore right now. Who are they and what are some of the ways in which they're different from their predecessors? Sure, thank you. Uh, I, I think I'd break that question down into, or the response rather, into three parts. Um, one is globalization, two, younger and more women, and number three, around investment preference. So, so very brief, briefly on each one of those, globalization, more, more than ever, we're dealing with cross-border families dispersed around the world, as are their investments. And that globalization, those crossing of borders, that naturally creates complexity. And that increased complexity creates exposure to more uh, legal regimes, succession tax and regulatory regimes, for which proper planning and asset structuring is, of course, critical to mitigate the risks that, that come with that complexity. Secondly, uh, as I said earlier, they're younger and there's more women. Now, family members involved in the oversight of wealth are getting younger and younger, with many families seeing the value of bringing them along earlier on that journey and that, with that sort of gradual inclusion into that wealth stewardship. Mm -hmm. and, and also with women. Uh, now, women have been there for obviously a long time and, and quite often behind the scenes historically. But what we've seen more recently is, is, is they're much more of a driving force uh, of that wealth stewardship. Many of them are very highly educated, and now they're, you're seeing them much more at the front versus sort of behind the scenes, as perhaps we've seen in the past. And then finally, on investments, I think that's evolving as well. I think prior generations, for example, had a, had a sort of preference for bricks and mortar for, for real estate, commercial and, and residential uh, globally. Whilst I think we're seeing the young, younger generation shifting a little bit more towards things like private equity, venture capital, particularly in the, in the tech and uh, EC, ESG space. And then finally, on the investment side, I'd say you're seeing, we're seeing more interest in private assets uh, as opposed to perhaps public assets as we've seen uh, historically. So I, I'd say those are probably the top three. Fantastic. Oh, that's, that's a brilliant summary. Thank you, Steve. Um, and so, Justine, these are the people that you're working with day in and day out, I think, in, in, your, uh, in your work. Can you tell us a bit more about them, who they are, who these people really are, and, and how, how they behave, and, and what you see day to day as you, as you cross paths with them? Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting themes that I've seen is that actually, although technically my client is quite often the elder generation, so quite often the sort of patriarch or matriarch of the family, um, increasingly what they're doing is asking the younger generation, so asking their children to be the ones who interact with me um, mm -hmm. and sort of handing over, I, I don't know whether it's control or, or influence or just input to that younger generation. Um, so sort of empowering the younger generation to be the ones that are discussing with the legal and other advisors um, how to structure and shape the family's affairs. Um, one thing that I do think is quite interesting, though, is the age at which that happens. Um, so Steve was talking just a moment ago about sort of the, the younger generation and, you know, this, this coming down, down a level in terms of age. Um, what I find quite interesting is that 
lots of the families that I'm dealing with, um, the patriarch or the matriarch doesn't actually empower the younger generation until they're well into their 40s or 50s. Okay. Um, in, in one case, actually in their 60s. Um, and the younger generation is quite often very successful, you know, very sort of um, up to doing this task. Uh, and yet the older generation doesn't sometimes like them to come in fully to the family's affairs until they're really quite quite a lot older you know in their 50s um, and have sort of proven themselves i suppose um, but it but it is an interesting theme because there's definitely a sort of shifting down of that empowerment um, to that younger generation in terms of interacting with advisors okay fantastic and um and Rennie, you're both a partner at the bank, uh, C. Co, and also head of philanthropy there. Can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of the people that work with you in, in your capacity as, as uh, head of philanthropy? Well, I think this, this focus on the way wealth is made, it seems to be a, a really huge theme. And initially it was looking at developing better tools for inside charitable trusts so the old paradigm was that you would focus very much on your grant making and you would have an investment pool that was there to maximize returns what you could end up inadvertently with those structures is the good that you were doing with your grant making was inadvertently outweighed by the negative externalities of your investment mm -hmm. so certainly inside our our charitable trusts that we we speak to our customers about we see them embracing this concept of total portfolio impact where both your investments and your grant making is doing good but that that seems to be going all the way through the financial supply chain so it doesn't stop at the point that the money comes across into the foundation certainly next generation family members are involved with family businesses are looking at making their businesses purposeful mm -hmm. so that the way that money is generated all the way through that that chain is absolutely integral to people being comfortable with their wealth embracing it and being um, much more proactive with it okay excellent and if there are sort of new models coming into play as as, as Rennie's just just described Mark, perhaps you can talk a little bit about the way in which decisions about which model to adopt or, uh, or how broadly to make decisions about investments are, are being made. Can, can you talk about your experience of that and what you've seen? Yeah, I think I've really, well, on the money, I think everyone's making the same point that there is a shift that's happening. Um, and what Ronnie was just talking about, about families wishing to invest um, their assets in not just of the of the foundations that they've established but personally particularly the the next gen in line with their understanding of the world around them and how they want to change it and there's quite a few foundations that i know in europe and in the us um, which have made this this shift so um it's expressed in 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 two ways really um for the foundation assets where the, a family might endow a foundation there's one particularly well-known european family that has made some very dramatic shifts with how they invest the corpus of their foundation. And are now that particular family, one of the biggest um, impact investors and allocators of capital to funds with an impact that um, certainly in Europe um, next to, and as big as some of the big professional institutions running that. That's quite an important shift. And, and then how they grant that, the capital from their foundation as well, um, is that they're, they're tending to I mean, in my area they, that uh, I deal with, um, particularly is, is, is climate change. They're making investments which are fossil fuel free. They've been supporting the divestment movement. They've been um, investing capital into sustainability strategies that deal with climate. And so they've got this holistic approach, which I think is quite important. And it's driven by a different generation. When it comes to their personal assets, um, the challenges that they're facing is where do they go to for uh, uh, advice? Mm -hmm. um, either in terms of uh, fund managers or investment advisors and um, there are a couple of families that I know um, very well-known families here in the United Kingdom that um, one of them in particular grants and supports Garden Tracker uh, where they they've skipped dealing with an investment bank or an investment consultants and have taken very specialist investment consultants to advise them on their impact strategies and and they've bypassed the usual 
kind of household name brands. Uh, and the reason for that, I think, is one of um, of trust and, and and understanding. They want to find people that understand the issues that they care about. So it's driven by personal connections, and um, they want to find people that are not stuck with thinking from the 80s and 90s, but are very much forward thinking. And sometimes you have to step outside of the mainstream to find that kind of advice. Fantastic. And I mean, I think each of our uh, illustrious panelists really has a role as an advisor to the type of people that we're talking about. It'd be interesting to hear whether, like, so how big you think your part in helping people to make these decisions should be. Should, is it an opportunity for you to guide them to be part of their decision making process? Or do you stand back and take a hands off approach and say, you know, it's really up to you. I'm just here to Ex execute your wishes. I mean, I'm sure you possibly all have different different views on that. But does anyone have have a have a particularly strong one they'd like to uh, put forward? Well, I, I, I don't mind starting, but it, it seems that like everyone is is deeply engaged with making sure their clients or customers get get the service that's appropriate. But um, I I think for for our role, we we try to build those trusted partnerships and. So my, inside the bank, I'm an 11th generation direct descendant of the founder of the bank. We do have some families that have banked with us since um, the 1600s and early 1700s. There are about 11 of those families. And so moving intergenerationally as a family is something that's very, very good to do alongside your customers. So I, I see the role that, that we have as, as absolutely essential. Um, in joining the partnership two years ago, I look at my career that I'm hoping to have at the bank and there will be, fingers crossed, another 36 years of it. Forming a, a relationship that is based on trust and right from the outset, they can meet a family member and owner is in, integral for um, forming those intergenerational um, relationships of trust where you can have transitions of wealth and you know that you can do it with an organization you trust. So I, I see my role as a partner as essential, but we can also look over nearly 350 years of overseeing intergenerational wealth transfer. And it gives us a lot of mistakes that we can look at as well, which I, I think are very, very important to, to be able to learn from as well. Fantastic. And uh, Justine, I mean, do you, do you have a view on this sort of how, how much you, you want to guide people's decision making process or, or how much you, you sit back and, and then sort of help them execute the consequences of those decisions? Yeah, I do. I do have a view, a, a strong view. I feel really strongly about it because I think, you know, as an advisor, um, what a client is looking for, particularly on the on the legal side, I, you know, I can talk to that. Um, what a client is looking for is not only what the law says, um, not only what the tax rules are, but they want to know how do other people do it. Mm -hmm. um, and they also want to know what, what's my opinion. So I have people all the time asking me, what would you do? You know, I understand the rules, I understand what the options are, what would you do and why would you do it? Um, and they want to know how other people do it. So they want to know how other families in similar situations do whatever the structuring question is um, and why they do that. And I think that's how they, that's how they form their views. And, and, you know, I think that's part of the value that we add as advisors is, is, is the experience of having done it before, having done it before with other families in similar or different positions and being able to bring that experience as a layer over to the technical expertise um, that we all, that we all have. Okay. Excellent. Um, and I mean, we were talking earlier about the ways that people weigh up their investments. I mean, it occurs to me that we could have a whole panel on ESG and actually probably another separate one on impact investing, another separate one possibly on philanthropy, or those, although they, those might cross over. But um, Mark, it's, it's clearly a big part of the story and it's one that you are, it's a world that you're very connected to. Um, but it's not the case that it's, it's simple. There, there are some ESG funds, there are others that are different and not all are created equal. Can you, can you talk a bit about what you've seen in, in recent years and how perhaps people are jumping on a bandwagon or perhaps people are misunderstanding what it could be, could and should be? Yeah, I think there's two approaches here. One is about risk management 
and the other one is about opportunity. And you've got a lot of professional investment managers now that realize that sustainability risks is like any other risk has got a risk that's got to be managed. And you hear this phrase ESG integration. Mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, there's a very well-known Swiss bank that announced last week uh, that all of their clients will now be recommended sustainable investment funds, which have gone through an ESG integration process. I got to welcome that. But the bit that I think the families, um, the most forward-looking families uh, are looking to do is, is, in the, is in the realm of opportunity. And I agree with Steve when he said that most of this is going to be in, in private markets. It's going to be private direct investments in corporates or via funds. Um, and they're going to be in um, areas of the market which are, um, they're going to be in agriculture and forestry and water and healthcare and education, where you're not going to have too many big known private equity firms with much expertise and so they're going to be niche managers so how do you how do you how do you be com get comfortable with that and the way they've been approaching this is to build this goes by this thing about trust and, and networks and fellow travelers as they build networks and i think there's two or three that have become to be well respected and well known there's one in the u.s that's moving to europe called the creo syndicate uh, which is made up of very well known um high net worth families and, and foundations and in Europe and but also now operating globally is a group called Tonic, Tonic with two eyes in it and uh, for families and high net worths and then there's a few others sort of sitting on the edges. I, I quite like the groups at Gratitude Railroad in America which is a club of high net worths that, and families that um, are interested in changing the world and understanding the world around them. So what you, what's common to all of this is, is relationships and, and trust and ability to do sometimes quite complex deals in, in difficult parts of the world and you just do it together and learn together and sometimes fail together and hopefully more often than not succeed together. Excellent. And and Steve, on the subject of the way that this, the, the way that the families invest may evolve in the future, um, you, do you have some thoughts on that topic? Well, I think, I think a few things. Um, I mentioned earlier the uh, the changing uh, appetite for types of investments, yeah. um, um, but I think just building on uh, and and related to what Mark was saying, I think the private asset space we see these ecosystems developing around the world, which Mark uh, referred to. And it's not just in the ESG space; it's it's broadly speaking in, in the private asset space. Um, some are sort of family offices getting together uh, informally or, or formally. We also see um, some providers providing platforms where they introduce their clients to one another on the sell mm -hmm. side and, and on the buy side. Um, so, so I think this, this will be an interesting development over the next 10 years in particular as to whether these um, uh, mini ecosystems somehow consolidate over time. You know, will we have a, uh, you know, a stock exchange, if you will, for private assets, um, a known one, a global one? I doubt it for in, in the short term, um, but it will be interesting to see how that develops. Now, I also agree with a couple of comments around trust. Um, the bigger families that we, we get involved with, more often than not, they get involved in an investment because they've talked to another family about it. Um, and they trust that family. They trust that mm -hmm. family's uh, advisors, et cetera. So I agree with that as well. Um, I think the interesting thing, and maybe we can come onto this later, but is around governance around that. Uh, mm. I think the structure of that will evolve uh, as well to sort of more institutional style uh, over time. Okay. And um, yeah, trust is clearly hugely important. It's, uh, it's a very general question and maybe a difficult one to answer, but, but how do you win the trust of the, the families that you, you work with? How do you, what do you think they respond to? Well, I, I guess in a few ways. Um, I like what uh, Justine mentioned earlier around, uh, you know, when, when a family asks you a question, it's not always the technical or, or you know, procedural response that they're looking for. They're, they're looking for what would you do? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's hugely, hugely valuable and, and builds a lot of trust. You know, where, where an advisor, be it in law, investment or trusteeship, whatever it is, where you feel that confidence with a client to say what I would do, I mean, that, that builds huge trust. I think the other thing is, is time. Um, so, you know, again, Justine referred to, I think, different generations. Um, in our field, a good part of our business is trusteeship and, and foundations where we do deal with successive generations. And 
like I said earlier, we're dealing with the younger ones, younger, <laughs> if I could put it that way. Okay. And the beauty of that is you've established that relationship over time. Now you have to be a little careful, and I think all the advisors can fall into this trap, that you're the advisor to the patriarch or matriarch, and you're viewed as somehow separate uh, from the next generation, and they feel like they have to get their own. And that has to be carefully managed um, by a lot of us advisors, uh, not just for our own business, but, but for the succession of the wealth itself to make sure that there is that continuity. Absolutely. And yeah, that, that point about governance is one that it might be interesting to pick up now, actually. I mean, um, perhaps this shift in attitudes and the, the new cohort, the new generation coming through might necessitate that family governance, family structures are, are different from and legislation and factors like that as well might play a part. Um, all making family governance different. I mean, Justine, this is really smack bang in the middle of your expertise. Can you, can you talk about the way in which you're seeing family governance evolve and change? What, what kinds of things are, uh, are coming to the fore at the moment? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think um, families are a lot more interested in family governance, which I, I think is a sort of a shift from the past. And in, in, in the past, I think many families, you know, the power, if you can call it the power, stayed with the patriarch or the matriarch until they were no longer there. And then it sort of was handed over to the next generation and maybe even just one person within that next generation. Whereas now, I think what families are thinking about much more is the longer term um, and how they want their family to be shaped. And it sort of ties into quite a lot of what we've heard earlier about um, on the investment side um, and the sustainable investment sort of, um, I guess, the drive towards that at the moment. Because I, what I'm finding at the moment is that families want their, uh, their, their next gens to be shaped by the values that they think are central to their family and essentially um, the governance structure that they put around the way their family works is all about the values of the family and making sure that those values continue over the generations. So what I see on the, on the legal side is um, quite a lot of working on legal structures, which are not rigid structures at all. Um, they're much more governance structures. They're not the type of legal structure that we used to see in the past. It's, it's definitely not rigid. It's very fluid, very flexible. But at the same time, what it does is it takes the family's values and tries to make sure that those values are understood and appreciated and implemented, if we can use that word, across the different structures that, um, that hold the family's assets and that allow for the family to interact over the next generations. So certainly that's something that I'm seeing a lot more work on on the legal side. Okay, excellent. And, and Steve, in terms of... Uh addressing this question of family governments are, are there models that people are using pop, or templates that people are using or are there philosophies that have guided companies or families in the past that you think are effective yeah I, this is an evolving space it's a, it's a fascinating one which i follow closely and, and i guess i'm part of in many ways um you know i agree with what justine said you start with a vision a purpose uh, values whatever, however you describe it and the way i would put this is so many of our clients are successful, excuse me, successful entrepreneurs, executives that run their businesses with a governance framework. So the natural question is why wouldn't you arrange your wealth in a similar way? In about, but not necessarily all, but the best or most relevant parts of that institutional uh, governance, that mindset and apply it again in that wealth uh, uh, context. I mean, think about it, multi-jurisdictional families and assets, multi generational succession, uh, multi-asset classes. I mean, there's a lot of complexity there. So again, I think as I referred to earlier, having governance around that is important. And I think something Mark mentioned earlier as well, you know, just one example uh, uh, around risk monitoring, right? Um, and, 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 and KRIs, I mean, who would have thought in families, in wealthy families that you'd have that sort of um, uh, element to a governance system and help, you know, helping preserve that wealth over time. And I think, more to your question on what examples are we seeing or, or, or models, I think the family offices is clearly uh, uh, one that has emerged over the last decade, single family offices and multiple, multiple family offices. I think they're, they've fast emerged and continue to emerge as that wealth steward. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, the entire wealth ecosystem is, is, is shaping in a different way now, uh, where family offices are, are taking, the, you know, because of that trust, uh, again, coming back to that, 
and employing the best in class of lawyers, of investment advisors, of trustees, et cetera, and having that quarterback or that steward be the family office. I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see more of that. And I, and I also think we're going to see the discipline and governance that we talked about earlier being employed via that family office uh, model over, over the years to come. Okay. Fantastic. And um, well, we're lucky to have Rennie here because not only is he uh, an important part of a business that advises uh, high net worth families, he's also uh, a member of a family that has kept a business going and not just surviving, but thriving for, is it, it's nearly 350 years now, I think, Rennie. In, in two years time, yes, it'll be 350 years. So, I mean, just, just a quick question. How do you do it? I, th I, th I think it's, it's getting everyone to agree to the rules of the game and that, that becomes embedded. Uh, this, this discussion about governance is not insubstantial um, and I think, I think we've, we've had the good fortune of, of finding a structure, so um, a partnership structure that, that really promotes long-term thinking, it promotes accountability and also it gives a way of not diluting um, shareholdings too far. So when I, when I look at us, the founder of the bank and his wife had 17 children. So you'd sort of imagine what lockdown would have been like for them. But when, when you play that forward nearly 350 years, um, there are now 2,400 living direct descendants of the founder of the bank. However, it is only the six of us that are the owners of it. And so we think very carefully about who we bring into the business and then who we bring into the partnership. And the reason for that massively focused attention to detail is that underpinning our structure is unlimited liability. So our decision-making, all of our assets are tied with, for me, it's my other five um, cousins who, who I'm working with. And so that unlimited liability, that huge accountability is, is the, the reason why I think we've, we've managed to last such a long time. I think the, the final bit is about when you do make mistakes, learning from them. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk about the seventh generation, the third generation being the one that could learn um, a lot from because they almost certainly blow up the business. Mm -hmm. For us, it was the seventh generation and not focusing enough on the banking um, and so for, for those um, families that are tuning in listening to this I, I think it's focused on the third and also from our experience it's focused on the seventh as well. <laughs> um, and I mean what what yeah what further than that what would your advice be or what what things have you learned along the way or has the family as a whole learned that you could you could offer as a as experiences to be shared with other families sort of trying to do the same thing essentially? Well I, th I think the the one thing we're absolutely certain about is that once you've seen one family business or one family office you've seen one family business or one family office uh, in terms of a template that you can bring out and repeat over and over again if you're thinking you can create that you completely missed the point about families they have complex dynamics based on human relationships and so all I'd say is find the thing that matches up for you and um, I, I wouldn't want to say that everyone moves to a partnership unlimited liability model that's what's worked for us that's what's allowed our cousins to buy into the rule of the game but it's understanding what makes your family tick is the really crucial thing. Okay, thanks. I, I think Ed, Edwin, on, if I sorry. if I can just make a comment on that, I think that's really interesting because I think the, the sort of lack of template is something which not a lot of people understand. Um, I, I had a client the other day who said to me, "Could you just give me a template family charter?" Um, and the answer is actually no. I can give you the headings that other people think are important or that I think you may want to consider, but I can't tell you what you need to put in there because ultimately it's going to be a decision for each family. I can help guide you through it, but there is no template. Each of these things has to be written essentially with the family's own perspective in mind. And that's a very, very personal perspective. And um, so I think it's a question for all of us as advisors to, to help guide families, but not to write it for them. Absolutely. Um, and Mark, I think you've spoken in the past when we talked about sort of 
understanding how you can align those values and that and that process i mean do you do you have any thoughts on the best way to arrive at a well maybe it won't be a consensus but something approaching a consensus or something that uh gui guides these families when they're making these kinds of decisions well i'm, I'm going to focus on one thing in, in my response is that a lot of the families that i've got to know over the years have been keen to try and change the world around them and mm -hmm. I worked for a family, um, Halloran, Harry Halloran of Halloran Philanthropies in America, uh, who became a key early funder of uh, Benefit Corporation, the B Corporation movement, which is about creating corporates which are more inclusive and, it's, um, and, and that you can now establish them in law as, uh, as, as benefit corporations. And he was driven about how he wanted companies to behave with their stakeholders, their employees. Um, and you see this with other foundations and family endowed foundations. And the one that I think about, which is quite an experimental network, is uh, a group of families have, um, have been funding a group called Partners for a New Economy. The website's p4ne.org. And what they're trying to do is that the name indicates is think about um, how can we change the whole discussion about markets, uh, capitalism, finance, investment, um, and its relationship with the natural world and, and with people. Um, and so they're quite forward looking and they, they think about, okay, you know, we, uh, given the urgency of the climate crisis, for example, and, and everything we're learning about the loss of biodiversity, they're thinking, okay, we've, we've now made uh, our wealth. How can we do something that helps protect for future generations? So their investment is not done from an esoteric perspective, or their philanthropy is not done from an esoteric perspective, they're doing it, I think, because they understand that the way business has worked in the past has been damaging and they want to think about how they can protect for future generations and for others. And that's why they're forward looking about protecting the health of the planet through how they do their philanthropy and how they invest. And um, what's your sense of the proportion of wealthy families that are taking this as seriously as you would like them to take it? Um, I think things like the giving pledge uh, have been important, but uh, in my in my space, in, in particularly um, with carbon tracker with climate, is you've got five or six families, um, billionaire families that I've come to know, and and their energy is about solving the climate crisis, and they're giving away a vast sums of money uh, to try and tackle this urgent crisis, and through philanthropy and through how they in, how, through how they invest and platforms like Climate Works and the European Climate Foundation are networks that bring those, those families and, and high net worths together with urgency. And, and it's been interesting to see how they work. And, and um, what I've seen the difference in philanthropy is in the past you go, well, let's give a grant to a wildlife project. Now they're giving grants to take and trans try and transform the way financial markets work and are driven by the urgency of creating sustainable financial systems that, that work for everybody. Fantastic. Great. Well, um, just to wrap up this portion of the panel, perhaps I can use Mark's, uh, Mark's uh, speech just there to ask everyone for a quick answer on what they would either like to see uh, the H&W families that they, they work with do more often or the advice that they would give. Is, is there some way in which you'd like to, to shape the way that these, these families behave or which you'd encourage them to, sh to shape themselves? Um, Rennie, perhaps we can start with you. Thank you. I, I, think, I think it's certainly about getting the next generation involved earlier and not being frightened to do so. What, what you'll find is it's an amazing learning experience and the co-creation of something where both generations are doing it simultaneously, it's a lot stronger. Mm. Okay. Fantastic. And Steve, can we come to you next? Um, first of all, I definitely agree with Ronnie. I think what I would, uh, I would also say um, is what I would want to see, and I think I will see, uh, is seeing wealthy families around the world as leading and driving the commercial value proposition of ESG. So essentially, you know, leveraging capitalism into improving our world where we need it and having those wealthy families be a real driving force uh, in that space. And then the only other thing I'd say is sort of seeing more discipline uh, and that institutional size uh, style, excuse me, governance and around ensuring wealth succession or helping to ensure wealth succession. Excellent. And Justine, the last word to you, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'd say uh, in terms of sort of planning and structuring, I'd say 
what's crucial is to make sure the right people are around the table. And I mean the right people both on the family side and on the advisory side. So picking up on Rennie's comment there, I would say making sure that the right family members, the right generations around the table, um, and that it's important that uh, all generations are represented, um, obviously uh, apart from the youngest, youngest ones, but that the generations who, who can have a voice are represented around that, that table, but also that the advisors um, are all around the table, because I think sometimes families um, seek advice in silos and that isn't always helpful. I think a sort of collaborative, inclusive approach is something which makes sure that the family is well served for the long term. Very good, very good, thank you. Well, so uh, Rennie Hall of C. Hall & Co, Mark Campanale of uh, Carbon Tracker, Justine Markovitz of Withers and Steve Sokic of IQEQ, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I'll draw this section of our panel to a close, but I think uh, we'll be available for the audience to put in their own questions and uh, grill you uh, on, a, on a call, which we'll do in just a few seconds. But uh, for now, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>